Hi, I am a naturopathic doctor, Saul Marcus, and I'm with my colleague, Claire Archie Diacano. And on this, we're going to be talking about um, lab tests for parasites. And these are the types of lab tests that you will get by going to a naturopathic doctor, someone similar who works in natural health. And these are a little bit different than the lab tests that you would get from a medical doctor. Now, some parasites of concern that we're going to be going over tests for include amoeba or entamoeba histolytica, GRD. Cryptosporidian, Trichinella, Ascaris, and Toxoplasmosis. Um, so we'll be getting into those. So let's go to um, the problem with conventional lab tests. So one of the major problems with conventional lab tests, very difficult to see parasites. In most cases, you're not going to be able to see them. For example, amoeba are very small and they're very easy to miss when you're looking at them with a microscope. Another problem with the conventional lab testing is that they usually don't use any other markers other than visual. So, for example, they don't run antibodies and they don't run inflammatory markers. And those are good indicators of whether or not the immune system is going after parasites. One test that they do run is one of the white blood cells, that's eosinophil. But even though they run it, they often don't check it. It's supposed to be really from zero to the lab test says about five, but really you want it between zero and three. And most doctors will not look at that to determine whether or not it's positive. Another problem is that many of these tests are treated as absolutely definitive when they're really not. You can go in and say, oh, I think I have a parasite, and they'll run one stool test. And if they don't happen to catch any parasite in that sample, they'll say, well, you don't have any, and that's 100%. But very often, you will get a false negative. So you can run the same stool test over and over, and it just keeps showing up negative, even though there's parasites there. So let's go over some functional lab tests and why they're a little bit different. First of all, they're performed by smaller labs that specialize in just a few tests. Because when you send a sample off to whatever, like Quest or LabCorp, that's a really huge company and they have thousands of labs that they're testing for. A functional lab company will have a smaller set of labs and they're focused on just those. So if the person at Quest, they might not be looking at parasites under a microscope or all the time but if you go to specialty lab at least for that part you're getting someone who does it all the time and they might be better at it um, something else these functional labs are typically used by naturopathic doctors and other people in the field and not only do um, most conventional doctors not use smaller more specialized lab companies they don't even seem to be aware that they exist the smaller companies will have expanded panels that look for uh, visual markers such as can they see it, but they'll also have non-direct markers looking at antibodies to see if there are parasites. I'm just going to list some common labs. These aren't all of them, but Diagnostic, Doctors Data, and Genova seem to be the biggest. The lab markers that we're going to go over are specific for a Diagnostic um, panel, but there's a lot of similarities between them and the other labs. The first test that's done in the stool sample is something called Secretary IgA. And this can either be elevated or it can be reduced. So when it is elevated, it indicates increased immune system activity. So that shows that the body is possibly going after parasites. The more elevated it is, the more likely that there are parasites there. When it is suppressed, it indicates that the immune system has basically just been worn out. And there are other tests that can determine whether or not that's a genetic immunity deficiency or if it's just because the immune system has been wiped out, either by having parasites or other infections. You can do IgA testing against specific allergies, such as food or even parasites. This, this little picture is kind of an example of what IgA does. It's created across the entire um, length of the GI tract, and it basically is there to tag along to um, either pathogens like parasites, different bacteria, or food particles, things that 
may not belong there. When IgA tags on to these foreign proteins, it basically tells the immune system, this is something we need to look at, this is something we might have to go after. So it's basically showing immune system response. One of the um, parasites that there is an IgA test available for is Entamoeba histolytica. So this is just basically amoeba. It's small. It's just a single cell parasite, so it makes it hard to see on a microscopic exam, but it's very, very common. Now, there are going to be some common symptoms of it, like dysentery, you're just going to the bathroom all the time, colitis. Uh, that's inflammation in the bowels. There can be some really bad symptoms like liver abscess or infections anywhere where this parasite may travel to. Because um, while officially you might hear that uh, most people won't have any symptoms, it's possibly very dangerous because it can leave the digestive tract and it can go about anywhere. So that's one reason why amoeba should be a consideration in, say, chronic fatigue cases. But something else that it does is trigger the immune system and it can cause or immune disease as well and that's something that's not uh, I think well appreciated absolutely another type of parasite is blastocystitis and that's usually only tested for by a microscopic exam so if your doctor is not well versed in parasites it's very easy for him to miss it if he's only looking for it the asymptomatic but usually people will have loose stools, and what should be noted is that it can cause both diarrhea or constipation. So just because you have diarrhea, don't say, oh, I can't have that, that type of parasite. Or just because you're constipated, don't think, oh, well, I can't have that type of parasite because it causes both. And of course, it causes abdominal pain, itching, and loose stools. The next one is Trichinella. This is a type of roundworm, and it's commonly found in pork. But just because this is where it's most often gone from, that doesn't mean that if you don't eat pork, there's no way you could have this because it might be something else or maybe you had food prepared by someone else who does eat pork. Like You don't know. It shouldn't be an assumption. Trichinella is kind of nasty because it leaves larvae that actually leave the GI tract and they go into muscle tissue. Uh, we decided it's best not to put any gross pictures on this presentation, so you're just going to see text, but you can find pictures um, online easily where you see trichinella, these little like, worms, they become embedded inside muscle tissue um, itself. And these things can remain viable for years. Uh, it may be um, totally asymptomatic or cause irregular um, digestive symptoms Symptoms, nausea, diarrhea, abdominal cramps, um, but it can cause you know, other symptoms like a muscle pain, weakness, fever, headaches, inflammation of other organs. And just a point that we can see between whether trichinella or amoeba is some of these parasites don't just cause digestive symptoms, they can cause systemic symptoms. And that's why um, a practitioner who's looking at you know the total picture might be interested in parasites and GI health. Absolutely. And one of the most common parasites is actually tapeworms. And they can actually travel to the brain and cause things like headaches, seizures, blurry vision, and they can cause muscle pain, and they can actually create cysts in the muscles. And of course, they create abdominal problems as well. So stomach pains and either diarrhea or constipation. Yeah, and people have these. I've seen people come back with lab tests, positive IgA tapeworm, didn't see anything visually. And of course, if tapeworm comes out of you, then you're going to see it, but it may not do that. Um, one of the worst cases of chronic fatigue syndrome I ever saw, that was a tapeworm case. Um, interestingly, the only thing positive was um, the amoeba histolytica um, IgA and the eosinophils. But when we treated the amoeba using antiparasitic, some other stuff came out. Um, next one, Toxoplasmosis gondii. Uh, this is most commonly associated with cats because it will affect cats and it will be in basically cat feces. Absolutely. And of course, the most common infestation in the world are roundworms. 
and those create many nutritional deficiencies and they can affect the liver, the pancreas, severe diarrhea, which is part of the reason why they create the nutritional deficiencies. They also create a spastic cough. So that may seem random because you develop the diarrhea and you also have a cough. So if you have those two things, you might want to suspect roundworm. Uh, some other ones, these are a little more common, and medical doctors might test for these. I don't say more common, I mean the testing might, is a little more common. Giardia, cryptosporidium, clostridium. Um, these are the sort of parasites that will, typically will create more severe and very obvious gastrointestinal symptoms like severe diarrhea, abdominal pain, bloating, uh, vomiting. Uh, so th- and usually in this case, there'll be, it's more likely that someone says, I, I have all these GI symptoms and it almost seems like a parasite. Uh, I've seen Giardia come up on the functional labs when it didn't come up um, elsewhere. Um, people can get it from out in the wilderness um, if they don't drink clean water and it can cause some um, chronic um you know, digestive problems. Um, Giardia has been an exception in that if I were to see Giardia, I basically would refer out for antibiotics. Um, That's my experience. But um, for most of these parasites, I don't have problems on basically just treating it with herbs. Some final lab tests that are great markers uh, is something called lysozyme and alpha antichymotrypsin. And basically, they test for inflammation because when you have a parasite, they do cause a lot of inflammation in the digestive tract. Sin actually measures pancreatic enzymes. Almost everyone with parasites seems to think that they need a digestive enzyme, but that's not always the case. So that's one of the things that can measure that. It's always important to do a bacterial culture just to see what type of bacteria you have. A yeast culture can be helpful, but the only thing is that sometimes you can get false negatives. I've seen that happen. And lastly, the secretary IgA testing for allergies for things that are very common, which are wheat, eggs, cow milk, and soy. Okay, now what we're going to do is make a follow-up video to this where we're going to go into more detail on the other sorts of functional lab tests. This video, we're trying to focus a little more on the parasites. So I'm going to put up a link on this page. Um, So when the next video is available, it'll just link right there. And I think um, that's it for now.